Okay. We're going to go ahead and get started. Thanks for coming out to see Lights Bookstore tonight. Uh, we have John Lang here. He's going to read from his new collection of poetry, uh, Intro Postine Blues. So please welcome John Lang to City Lights Bookstore. Thank you, Ian. Well, thank you, Ian. I always feel like this is old home week when I come up here. Um, I always stop at City Lights. I have a place near here, um, a place that I um, got from Thomas of 20 years ago, and I've been coming up, spending a lot of time, about five, five or six miles from Cullowee. So thanks for everybody, everybody for coming tonight. So this, I told Thomas today, we did a little radio show, and I told Thomas that I felt like that after 20 years in the English department at a small liberal arts college and now 10 years in an environmental studies program as the humanities person in an environmental studies program, that this is my first environmental studies book of poetry. <laughs> and um, the reason I say that is because um, I have a geologist um, in many of the poems that is sort of a persona that I speak through. I'm not a geologist, although I took a lot of geology in college. And the term Anthropocene, I'll get to that in a second, what it means, but the term is an anth a geologic term. And then also, this book, more than any book that I've, I've ever written, um, speaks to some of the large issues that we're faced with today, such as two major ones, climate change and species diversity, the loss of species diversity. Um, this book has more dead animals in it than any book you'll ever read, I think, unless it's a hunting guide, maybe. Um, I think I counted once, there are 21 dead species in this book of various types. And um, somebody asked me um, why I've, I've got so many dead animals in this book, and the reason is I wanted to find some poetic way to point out this, this whole issue of species diversity and how much we're losing in the, the sixth great extinction, as it's called by many scientists today. Um, so over and over in the book, I keep returning to roadkill and to, to dead animals. So um, the Anthropocene is um, a term, a geologic term for the, the age we're living in now. Many geologists feel like we've passed from what was called the Holocene, which only lasted 12,000 years, into this new period where we've made such an impact on the planet that we will be geologically significant in the future, that people a million years from now, if there are people a million years from now, will be able to look back and see in the actual um, record, the actual geologic record, the soils, the rocks, the impact of what we've done to the planet. So therefore, they, they, a lot of people are saying we need to change the actual name of the period. Not everybody agrees yet. The geologists are slow. They, 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 you can't get them together on anything. And so they have refused to vote in the Anthropocene officially yet. So I'd just like for the record to say that tonight, I think we're officially still in the Holocene. But <laughs> tomorrow morning, who knows? We could be in the Anthropocene. So I'm going to start off. Um, as I said, these, these poems, um, there's a geologist, the geologist, and he appeared, he or she, I'm not sure, female, female, appears all the way through the book. And I think of this person as being a geologist out in the field, but it's a literary geologist. It's somebody who loves poetry, writes poetry, but also sees the world as a geologist sees it, which mostly is through time. If you know anything about geology, if you don't believe and if you're not impacted by deep time, you're not impacted by anything. So um, this first poem that opens the book is called The Geologist on Oyster Factory Road. Oyster Factory Road is an actual road on Edisto Island down on the coast of South Carolina. Um, listen for musical words. Um, that's the blues part of this. Um, and listen for, um, for ideas of time that might be surprising to you. They're all through here. The geologist on Oyster Factory Road. I listen for the blue notes. An older assemblage. You know, blue crab old. Or even lichen old. Not mammalian. More like crickets chanting in the live oaks. Or the wind full of plaintive compositions. And what of pluff mud riddled with stalks of dead cord grass, a compendium drafted in a single season supplication. In the chorus of caucusing herring gulls, I hear woodshedding. But I am the block's new kid, K 
can't crash that circle of song, but I try anyway. I attend the formations of pelicans retreating to their distant sanctuaries. If they sing, it is only there, keeping their own monkish counsel above the shell clacking bank and strand. An old man walks the beach with a red metal detector. His wife next to him carries a plastic bag full of black fossils picked from the tide's rack line. Like minor chords remaining from an aria scored a million years ago, and she's still listening. He doesn't care, wearing earphones as if the sand is hip hop. I believe in words, but this morning that faith may be misplaced, like looking for shark's teeth. How you scan the sand for a break in the pattern, and you don't look for the tooth itself. Maybe you don't listen for the song either. Maybe listening is like the way names remain on maps long after the thing itself. You see, my hobby is the least turn, splashing offshore each dive a dart of song from a failing concert hall. If I listen closely, I will disappear, like the tide receding, or those tiny fiddler crabs, secure in their shallow holes. So, to me, I hear that, and I start hearing things like tiny fiddler crabs secure in their shallow holes, I'm thinking, wow, that's like human beings. <laughs> We're like tiny fiddler crabs secure in our shallow holes of time, of, prospect, of, pr of progress, of, of, of all the things we think of. So one of Thomas's favorite poems really, um, really connects with this one in ways I didn't know until today when Thomas asked me to read it on show. I'm going to read it now. This is another geologist poem. Um, and this comes from my time when I, visit, I visited um, Mexico a lot. I've taken students there and I did a month in Mexico visiting um, Mayan cities that you can only get to by river. We spent two weeks um, on the Usumacinta River going down and going in the rainforest and going to these cities. And, and um, at this point a lot of that comes from, from that time. But it's another poem about time, and it's another poem about animals. So far, they're all alive. I don't think I've got any, well, shark's teeth, there's a dead species. <laughs> um, but um, but there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of ana, there's a lot of Im animal imagery and a lot of time imagery in this poem. The geologist anticipates the end of time, and I don't have this in the book, but it's for Tom. It's a prose poem. Doesn't have quite the, the music and the rhythm of that first one. The Mayans named it the Long Count and described their days with snakes, frogs, water lilies, and crocodiles. All the things we've named put in field guides bled of terror. Wading a slough back of Akamal after a thunderstorm, I think of black elk of Harney Peak in the Dakotas, centers everywhere and nowhere how afternoon thunderstorms blow in from the east, crash against sea cliffs, the Mayan coast, pile up, break, leave the Yucatan lowlands each inches deep in flood, break. Where there is water, there is magic. Where there is magic, there are always frogs, especially in the tropics. 20 species call like sharp, whistling voices of lost Mayan gods. The distended yellow eyes of the holy tree frog, royal digits, open mouths like burial urns. Waist deep in natural history, the past spins like a great cycle that rolls back, different every time in content but not in form a calendar that spirals instead of flips in four-dimensional space, not flat and disconnected like old maps of the world, month to month, horizon to sharp horizon. There, are mo there were monsters at the edges in 1492, but 400 years later, they are everywhere. And this season, the same one called Took 830 years ago. Trust the scripture of travel, of mystery and diversity. The frog night 
come back strong on animal voices of a thousand worldly gods. Live with contrast. Go south to learn. Make your way home. Change through sloughs past the shell blue Caribbean, pale pink temple condominiums, and praise the holy sun distended above the gulf. Um, so there's another strand in the book. There are all these geologist poems. There are a bunch of them. There's probably 15 or 18 of them. The geologist does this. The geologist does that. The geologist sees this. And then Thomas doesn't know this. I've never said it. But Thomas actually inspired this long poem I wrote called Erosion. Um, he called me, and he, he published a book of mine 20 years ago called Against Information and Other Poems. And he called me and he said, John, you've got to write another Against Information. It's been 20 years. <laughs> um, and I, I sat and I, I worked on this long poem on my porch. And my idea was it was going to be about the digital age, but it was going to be up, updated 20 years. And... Um, I never could get it right as a long poem, I didn't feel like, but, um, but I worked on it anyway, and I was reading a poet named A.R. Ammons the whole time who wrote a book, a, a, book, a book of poetry that won the National Book Award back in the 80s called Garbage, and it was an entire book called Garbage, and it was in couplets, long lined couplets, and I was, I was thinking about all this digital stuff and I was thinking about A.R. Ammons and I started writing this long line in couplets. And um, what I did is I broke it up into pieces in the book rather than ran it all together. But I want to read you one of those, maybe two of those. The first one's a little bit longer, a page and a half. But I changed the title. I called it, I wanted a, a reference to A.R. Ammons, so I, I couldn't call it garbage, but I called it compost this. That was my, my updating of A.R. Ammons. But somebody said to me, that's just too silly. You just can't do that. And so I, I started focusing on the idea of, of things eroding. Since the geologist, right? Okay. Because everybody knows the three major parts of the world system that geologists are interested in is um, erosion, transportation, and deposition. Those are the three things that make the whole world go around. Erosion, transportation, and deposition. So here's erosion. Here's the first one. And this is the one that I wrote first when I was trying to get into the against information mode that Thomas got me into. Erosion. We can write poems that disintegrate before the reader's eyes. A.R. Ammons. The present erodes each online search, or was there ever a present to start with? Photos stored off-site in the cloud, as we say. And let me tell you, there are enough clouds to go around these days. No hold or holds barred in the fist fight we call a digital culture. Like those photos on Facebook we wish would disappear, they're somewhere in a million Google data servers centers worldwide using 220 megawatts of power. That's mega fleets of servers, sometimes as many as 10 million computers, connection to connection, to power up for all those searches by possible or noisy or nosy current employers. What were we thinking? Shirt off beer pong, shit-faced. Why search unless something is really lost? And what is? That is the question begs all those useless trivia answers, conundrums, cacophonies, information feeding our brains, fogging the windshield of what matters, like the death, like death on the Chattooga, a rafting tourist, Fallen out at jawbone, swept in high water, all this rain into Sockham Dog, the body snagged somewhere in the real maelstrom, or the dead woman on the Potomac, swept from her kayak below Great Falls, or the other tourist in swimmers rapid on the Yakagani, his leg caught in a discarded throw rope, called a safety rope by one report. The stories moving on Google, one search after another, they're all three dead. 
no matter how much living remains in currents of ones and zeros, moving server to server, posted on Facebook, pictures, tributes, video shot weeks before, so funny then, so painful to watch now, of her running a waterfall. The view count heading toward viral now that she's dead. There are ghosts we all see just out of the corner of our eyes. Fog moving in our valley where there is no fog. But these digital ghosts don't go away. At least until the solar flare or the half mile wide asteroid predicted by a panel on the Weather Channel <laughs> Web pages left up, abandoned like the Bilo grocery store, the roof collapsed, the windows like eyes thumbed shut. The messages piled up in Gmail, comments, numbers still live for dead people on Skype, these will never compost like discarded beer koozies in a black plastic bag, our digital life built up toward heaven in its ghost mound. <laughs> Thomas, Thomas asked me today, what way does Native Ameri my, my interest in Native American culture figure into my poetry? And now I'm seeing it everywhere, the ghost mounds, you know, at the end. I mean, I'd, I'd not thought about that when I wrote it, but so I wrote this long poem, um, and um, they're all through here, and I wanted to read one more of those. Um, this one's much shorter. Um, at, at the end, when the book was near completion, a friend of mine helped me with this book. He's the one who actually suggested as a poet, a poet named Ray McManus. And Ray actually read the book, and I had all the poems, the erosion poems, together as one poem. And he said, break them up and don't call them erosion one, two, three, four, five. Just call them erosion, 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 <laughs> erosion. And, and he said, and you also need a, book, a poem in here that connects the geologist and this poem somehow. So I wrote this. And this is one of those poems that's all questions. And erogeny is not sexual. <laughs> I mean, it might be. But erogeny is a geologic term. It's the term, but it sounds Sen sensual. Uh, <laughs> Betsy hates it when I do that with my, my hands when I'm <laughs> talking about erogeny. <laughs> um, so erogeny is the rising of the mountains. That's the term that geologists use for the mountains over time rising. So you'll know that word when you hear it. So it's all questions. Is geology a kind of poetry? Is erogeny uplift? The syncopation of named eons laid end to end? Were they really clanking toward our future? Is geology the story we should put our hominid minds to? Is the Anthropocene us or are we all? Is geology poetry? Is poetry geology? Does the numerate have the upper hand or the numinous? Is that shock of red, is that a shock of red cardinal flowers? Or is that a hummingbird bustling between? Is it a buried sediment to be assayed for carbon in the present and tested? Are carbon levels to Geiger counter as stock markets are to CNBC? Is the latest species cha-cha toward oblivion our unrattled success? Is this age the joke our sapient ancestors wouldn't get? I don't know the answer to any of those questions. <laughs> <laughs> but you remember, this is a book of poetry, not an essay collection, not a novel, not a book of journalism. I like the sound of all those questions. I don't care what they mean. Um, I'm going to read a couple more, um, and then we will can ask some questions and See, well, I always like to read, I'm going to read, a, somebody, somebody asked me, they said, you've got to read more of those shorter poems. So I'm going to read, um, I'm going to read two shorter, shorter ones with dead animals in them. <laughs> two dead animal poems to end. Maybe I'll read another shorter one that's got this not quite so depressing. There's a dead animal. Oh my God, there is a dead animal. <laughs> Okay, this is, um, there's a poet I love named George Oppen. He's a modernist poet. And he has a line, this, the, the line is, first life, rotting life. 
and that became the, pi the title of this poem. Hunters dumped two deer in slack water behind the shoals, one whole decapitated buck and a small doe butchered, her head trailing like a flesh buoy, the stripped spine and shanks gnawed by a hungry bass. A lens in the community of strangers, their action, completed cycles, the deer stalked then shot, committed back to river water and silence. One more dead deer poem. You live in the country, you see a lot of dead deer. <laughs> this though, this came to me um, through an email a friend sent me this story and I made it into a poem. And also it's been pointed out to me, this is how your unconscious works as a poet, that there's a, there's a very direct um, parallel in this poem to a famous poem by William Stafford um, that I didn't get when I wrote it, but now I see it perfectly because of, the, of one particular word. So uh, and I'll, I'll mention that when we get there. I wish I had a note about it now because it sounds like I just, but I was completely unconscious. Um, his poem is about stopping by the side of the road and there was a, a dead deer that has a living fawn in it and he kicks it into the canyon. Um, it's called, um, called dark, what's, the, what's the poem called, that poem called? It's Traveling Through the Dark. Yeah, Traveling Through the Dark. Which I taught for 20 years, so it was in my head. Um, hey, Scott, Mary, how are you? Have a seat. Yeah. Okay, so um, a friend sent me this story in an email, and I shaped it into a poem. Thank you, William Stafford, too. Fawn in a hay bale. The black snake in the median twisted into an unanswered question is the bloody point. No swerving, no faltering as any machine rolls fecklessly forward. Then to open a hay bale and find the paired ebony hooves still shiny, the auburn hair and splintered bones hidden no more in the sidelong silo. Death is a combine. Death is a spring morning smelling of straw and diesel fuel. Everybody knows, uh, that, I mean, I'm not sure if you know, but hunters often talk about, and farmers often talk about how, you know, um, deer will, will, mother deer, does will settle their newly born fawns in high grass and they often leave them in hay fields and they get, they get run over by the combines when they, when they do that. Not often, but they do. Uh, all right, I gotta get a, gotta get a, a couple of more, lighter poems <laughs> than those two. They're not all death, dead, dead animal poems in this book. Um, okay, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna end with um, two poems. I'm gonna read one of these. Um, um, this one's a, a dead, dead animal poem, but it's a, a more pleasant dead animal poem. It's about animals we eat. Um, um, Hal Herzog, right here from Silver, North Carolina, has a great book. Some we love, some we hate, some we eat. Well, this is one we eat. It's called Fish with the Head Still On. Sweet flesh from reef refuge. Tail fried crispy in lard. Careful with fork and fingers to cleave the superstructure <laughs> of fluid movement and flesh perfect formations, pencil thick, island fruit, fins, sharp barbs. You take a bite of Johnny cake, but grease fixed eyes can't quell your old bone fear, that fish camp terror, that dangerous flavor. It's almost like to kids you have to explain this today because kids think all fish are without bones and you know and and I grew up in a time when almost all the fish I ate had bones in it and I hated the idea that there were bones in there and I was always picking them out of my mouth and all the stuff but um, we can go through life now and not even think about bones the way we used to. So that's a little not quite as depressing. 
All right, the last poem I'm going to read is um, a little longer poem um, that was one of, it's one of the poems I really enjoy reading. Um, I love the, the great biologist E.O. Wilson, but I also struggle with him a tremendous amount. And um, I was reading his latest, latest book, this before Half Earth came out, the book before that. Um, and I was on a, a trip um, in, the, um, um, in the Virgin Islands, and I love to snorkel. And, um, and I, 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 this poem came to me. And um, it's a geologist poem, another geologist poem. So the persona of the ge geologist is the snorkeling geologist. And it's called, um, While Snorkeling, the Geologist Encounters E.O. Wilson and his book, The Social Conquest of Earth. You got to really, this has got a lot of time in it. And a lot of living animals. Floating like detritus through the national park, I kick a time or two. Past the urchins and seaweed and damn, this aquatic tourist community waves back as their eusocial cousin visits from the upper world of clear air and hard-won symbolic culture. Some say all this led to me, distant bipedal kin, now pushing the whole of life toward the sixth great extinction. And I'll admit, it's this gnarly drama that's in my head, on my mind, my pleasure island reading, E.O. Wilson's study of the whole of life from early sponges to the production of yachts for the tourist trade. Suspended in my 60,000 year old intellectual bubble, I marvel at reefs still carrying on like soldiers in the great campaign of life, transcribed half a billion years before we got our Pleistocene draft cards. Didn't this invertebrate district get the memo? Above their brittle ghetto floats the planet's boss, the big chief, the emperor of air, diesel fuel, bow thrusters, tax shelters. Yet down here, life goes on, though bleached of much of its color by our modern chemical toxins. I'm trying to put it all together in my poet's watery grasp, what Keats famously called negative capability, and I expel another scenario up my snorkel. We are so many billion bubbles in a briny blue melodrama with no choreographer and a set eaten by termites and ants. Mm -hmm. Should we really applaud how the show never closes? A few more nibbling fish and I try another morality tale. Maybe my ancestors of flippered Cortez and the squid and parrotfish don't know the colonial ships named You're Screwed and La Dolce Vita landed two million years ago when the big brain apes, a lot like me, came down from the trees. Then I round a drowned point, and there is Dr. E.O. Wilson himself, a big old barracuda come in from the deep water. I watch as his fixed eyes pass over me like nothing, a snorkeling poet, a sea cow, a moving point among the flowing arms of briny fans feeding on zooplankton. Wilson cruises on, gulping once or twice, devouring the minnows of religion and philosophy and art as he passes, feeding, feeding, feeding. We all go at it in our own ways. Mine lacks much of the enlightenment rigor of Dr. Wilson's new theoretical chapters on the history of evolution. No barracuda, I take my calories from romantic experience and build my own exoskeleton like the coral tips rubbed raw below me. I muse on how Keats would have liked snorkeling and how my three trips in 20 years have built a new colony of ideas and images piling up like an artificial reef around a sunken steamer. The torpedo fish passes again and it's a real barracuda. It's not Dr. Wilson after all. And interesting, he's interested this time only in my shiny wedding ring. So I hightail it for the Beneteau, leave Wilson's imaginary forms behind, and get real about the intellectual food chain.
<laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. So uh, that's um. Those of you who know my poetry know that. I mean, there's 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 echoes of against information. There are echoes of my earlier sort of um, William Carlos William imagist image image imagism. Um, period but this is very different for me this book and I really have enjoyed going around and talking with people about it and seeing what people think about these these things so I'm wide open for questions <laughs> I'm just curious yeah. what your, what your um, problems are with E.O. Wilson just you know on the back of that poem um, my problems with Wilson are the problems I have with, with science and I love science um, it's reductive um, Wilson has said repeatedly in print. I love art, I love literature, I love philosophy, but it's not as important and as big as science. There's always science and then there are these things. That's why I use the image of the gulping off. He's a, he, reduces, he reduces everything in that way. And he admits it. I mean, he says, I mean, I, I'm a try and trained scientist. I've got to believe that, as a, my, my teacher said, and I have trouble believing this, that my geology teacher said um, to me once when I was being philosophical, he said, John, all nature is scrutable. All nature is scrutable. In other words, you can understand anything in the physical universe. And the physical universe is all there is because it's all you can measure. In, in, in that term, in those terms. And to me, they're, in, they're inscrutabilities. Um, um, and, and there always will be. Um, E.O. Wilson has this wonderful image in one of his books that I've used in a prose book. He says he was in the Amazon or somewhere, he's studying ants, he's, he's an ant scientist, an ant biologist, and he, he looked up at the sky and he says, all of those points in the sky are what we know about the physical universe. And all that black is what we don't know. That's how the, the relate ratio between. But also in his mind was, if you give me enough time, enough money, and enough brain power, <clears throat> I can figure out the blackness, the dark. It can be figured out. And I don't think it can. I, I, I always have believed that there is mystery. I even say it in the poem you like, you know. I, I trust, I trust in mystery. And E.O. Wilson trusts in knowing. And um, he's not ashamed of that. And, and, and he loves poetry and he loves science, but it's, it's one level down from. He and Barry Lopez have had incredible discussions uh, about this. They, they founded a program together in Texas um, and, and in, engaged in this conversation. Yeah. 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 What else? Yes. This isn't actually a question, but. Uh, <laughs> Robert. Is it an answer? No. No. <laughs> we need some answers. I <laughs> I'm willing to buy that science is bigger. But Robert Sapolsky, when he's talking about animal behavior, mm -hmm. he says that when we say something is instinct, that's our way of saying we have no idea why it happens. I love that. I love that too. Yeah. 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 yeah not, not so scrutable. <laughs> it's just hard to trust science. You know, right? You know, science has gotten us into the predicaments that we're in right now. And, you know, to have absolute faith in science and to allow that, allow that faith to transcend your faith in art and beauty and all these other things that have actually carried us along as a species for so many millennia is really hard to accept. Um, we have nuclear weapons because of science. We have oceans that are destroyed because of science. We can go on and on and on with all the things that science has wrought upon us. The Green Revolution, whatever, in agriculture. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, there's yeah. more and more discussion yeah. about um, Yeah, one, one of the things that I, I didn't talk about was the geologists are arguing about when the Anthropocene actually started. Mm -hmm. um, there's a whole group that thinks it started with agriculture. Mm -hmm about 6,000, 7,000 years ago that when the, the terraforming of Asia yeah. with rice production, yeah. they point to that and go, that's when it started. <laughs> and then the, you move forward in time and um, another group feels like, no, 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 it started with the Industrial Revolution. That's when the hockey stick started up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, all these hockey sticks, you know. <laughs> well, that, that's when it happened, you know. And, um, and the third group um, believes, they call this the golden spike. I love that term. 
that they need to put a golden spike in somewhere to say, this is where it happened, this is where it started. And the third group thinks it was the, the um, detonation of an atomic bomb in the atmosphere because that laid down a nice little layer of some radioactive isotope that a million years from now somebody with the right instruments could say, oh, wonder where that came from, <laughs> in the way that we can look at fossil records and say, oh, it, you know, this is where the Paleocene started, you know, things like that. So, so um, that, that's interesting. Maybe, I, maybe it's these kinder, gentler geologists that I like. What if the geologists screwed up? <laughs> we, can, we, can, we can really take on the physicists and the biologists, but how about the geologists? What if they screw up? Petroleum geologists. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. So, and my teacher was a petroleum geologist who gave up on um, teaching um, in universities, teaching people to go out and look for oil. And, came to a small liberal arts college and taught poets. So that was that was really great. <laughs> Is he the geologist that you have in mind with this book? He's, yeah, yeah. I, I would say that that he is um, he is the like the geologist because he, he um he taught me, you know, he used Blake to illustrate wow. Um, time to see a world in a grain of sand, eternity in an hour. He would quote poets just constantly in class and stuff. The um, petroleum geologist he was teaching in Texas didn't like that. <laughs> they, thought, they thought that was kind of useless. <laughs> that was not going to help him figure out where the kerosene was. <laughs> um, but, but he loved um, he, he loved using poetry and teaching with that poetry. He's passed away now. He died. Um, I wrote on, I wrote about him and um, um, a lot, and wrote a couple poems that are in my were in my first book for him. But he died in 1987. Her young, he was in his mid 60s. Looks real young to me now. <laughs> um, and um, but um, you know, I was I was with him. I inter I was interviewing him for an article that I was writing up until the last um, couple of days of his life. Yeah, he died of, of um, bone cancer. And, uh, but but held court until the last day. He would he was he he would have us all in, and we'd sit around, and he he pontificate up wow. until uh, that day before he died. Yeah. True teacher. Incredible teacher. Yeah. Yeah. This is just um, it's, you know me trying to make sense of the world. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> uh, but um, you know the um, I mean, thinking about the Anthropocene and the split in science and nature and that seems to be like really dis a distinction within all of this is yeah. science and human human you know, human society can actually dominate nature and fix nature and all this stuff but manage it manage yeah. nature manage the planet right we can, <laughs> we can garden it all you know yeah um and fix it all but you know it seems like there was a point maybe in time maybe the 18th century with the enlightenment when science took off on its own and art went this way mm -hmm. and that that has just been getting wider and wider and wider i agree um and that we're really dealing with the fallout of that right now and you i know i've heard you talk about it before that you know what does art mean in the age of the anthropocene uh, yeah we're not sure yet i mean I, I i really do think that um a lot of visual artists are really trying to struggle with you know there's all kinds you can do a Google search and come up with 75 important um, artists who are using recycled materials to make art out of there that's a big deal and and, and that is an Anthropocene art um, um, the poets and, and fi fiction I guess dystopian novels are very popular today and, and um, oh shoot can I read y'all one more poem? Yeah. <laughs> um, if I can find my, my phone, I'll read it off the iPhone for Thomas. That's the one that got me on computers. The reason is because it's the first climate change poem I've ever written, completely. A complete, it's the poem I sent yeah. to you. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've worked on it some. But, um, but it's got that, a word in it that, that I think is funny that I just used. Um, okay. So, oh, um, so I don't, I don't know how. I, I mean, poetry is is beginning to, to um, try and respond to the Anthropocene. Art does, but um, 
fiction's doing a good a good job of it. Okay, there we go. Okay, this is called sugar sand. Does anybody know what sugar sand is? Sugar sand is that really fine white sand. Uh, uh, I was on the the um, panhandle of Florida when I wrote this poem, and everybody was talking about sugar sand, and I'd never heard of sugar sand. But sugar sand is the title. Everybody's writing elegies, why not me? Ruminating now, feet above sea level, five miles out Cape Sandblast at low tide. This strand will be underwater in 50 years, Bets Betsy's my wife. Betsy says at breakfast, our B&B fellow guest nodding in agreement. Then add their home range too, Philly, another coastal hot spot with city charters soon voided in a geologic minute by climate change. Today seems at least superficially a beauty. Yellow butterflies, a few migrating monarchs, a ubiquitous osprey fishing the shallow channel behind the inn. But the normal old, but the old normal is not the new normal. Instead, every glacier calves oblivion. After breakfast, we ascend 20-foot dunes in the state park, assembled by prevailing winds, an eon's easy tide. A woman huffs up from the gravel parking lot, complains, they make you pay for this view. Her husband, tan as a vanilla wafer, stalls before he can see the gulf, his plastic crocs filled with sand like concrete overshoes. When I achieve the dune line's last summit, I feel surprisingly dystopic before me. Cormac McCarthy's final scene in the road, a barren empty beach, a sliver of sugar sand and a slash pine, a few sharp blades of palmetto, a raw ocean to the horizon's end. All that's missing is the beached, plundered tanker and the petroleum smell of apocalypse. Back at the B&B, I watch a swarm of dragonflies like black drones case the yard, nothing hurried about their tactics, as if feeding time goes on forever, as if they know the end is gradual, like crabs in a pot of warm seawater, the burner on, all safe in our dark silos until it boils. <laughs> so, um, That, that's what came out of my vacation. <laughs> I, I, I struggled with E.O. Wilson when I was in the islands. This time, it's climate change. I'm making progress. <laughs> uh. Since you've been so immersed in this whole Anthropocene uh, idea, has it changed your personal stance of how you live personally in your own life? Or are you just you know, continuing pretty much the same way you were when you were not yet into this development. I think I'm more conscious of of the um, the alarm mm -hmm. than I was. That that's the thing that's really whether I'm not I'm still not I'm still not completely in the Anthropocene camp. I'm kind of like one of those geologists going. I understand why it's such an enticing idea. But, um, but, but the, the alarm, like I never, even though I've, I've never been a climate change denier and I've always read all this stuff and I've always been, I, I never got on the Bill McKibben bandwagon. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I'm on, I, I, I'm on this bandwagon. I'm on, especially the species extinction yeah. bandwagon, yeah. the sixth great extinction bandwagon and the two are related, but they're not the same thing. I mean, we could, we could put as much effort into species extinction as we're putting into climate change, although it wouldn't mean as much to us, probably. I mean, it, it's probably, it may be, but, but um, I, um, I have become more <coughs> alarmed. Um, and you're spreading the alarm in that book. Yeah, although, like Thomas pointed out in his review, in typical poetic fashion, it doesn't just sound one note. It sounds kind of a oh, oh note. <laughs> it's kind of yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe not. Um, and rather than, Ugh, you know, sort of the Bill McKibben approach. And I love Bill McKibben, but but the Bill McKibben is it's all about the alarm. We've got to sound the alarm. And I am like, 
sound the alarm, but make some humor, or do this, or do that, or, I mean, you described it. Yeah, I, you really picked it up well when you, when you did the, the review about that. That poet's ability, that Keatsian ability to hold, um, to hold um, contradictory opposites in your mind at the same time. The, that negative capability that I talk about in that poem. I mean, I've got it and I use it and I don't do it consciously. I just do it. And it drives my, my, my wife Betsy crazy sometimes because I'm always going, well, on this hand and then on this hand. I mean, I'm always, rather than vroom, you know, I, I'm, I'm always cha cha <laughs> side to side. Yeah, yeah. It's like somebody said once: if you want to send a message, well, this is this metaphor is old and dead now. But if you want to send a message, um, Western Union is a lot cheaper than poetry and a lot easier than poetry. You know, um, I mean, it's you know. So, so you've got sort of this is a message book. But the thing that I love about it is the sound and the images and the and the the the, 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 the stories and things like that. But I got to admit, it's also about the Anthropocene. Yeah. yeah. This all reminds me of <laughs> what Brent was talking about. I had, of course, I had a, a conversation uh, with Stephen Hawking years ago, and, and he, he was coming out very strongly against metaphysics. I mean, meta, um, metaphysics? No. Um, yeah, metaphysics. Meso yeah. And he said, no, 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 that's all wrong. It's either science and math or it's nothing. I mean, mm -hmm. To get the answers we need. Yeah. And um, I tried to, to show him or explain to him that there's a lot of different types of notation. And the poets, the musicians, uh, the uh, mathematicians mm -hmm. are using a different language, but they're all saying the same thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He couldn't get it. Yeah. Or yeah. he wouldn't get it. But yeah. what Brent's saying is that, you know, the artists and all, it, yeah. it takes the balance. You know. And that's why I yeah. gravitated at Walford from 20 years of teaching in an English department where I was in my silo with, with the other 14 people who were in the silo of English and we talked about English things and we, and we were all English professors. And, um, and 10 years ago I headed a committee that created the first environmental studies, the first truly interdisciplinary program that Walford had as a college so that now every day I have to deal with scientists, I have to deal with social scientists, and they have to deal with me. <laughs> and, um, and it's amazing how different the, the percep per perspectives are um, on an issue, even like climate change. I mean, I mean the scientists can, can be 99% certain, but that doesn't mean the social scientists are on, <laughs> are on board and the policy is going to get made, which we see very clearly. And that, then the question of how do we write poetry about climate change? I mean, is this a good climate change poem or is this just a, a didactic climate change poem? You know, I, I mean, so, I mean, we don't know yet how, 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 uh, how that works. Yeah, yeah. Right there, is, uh, there, there are two sides to the Anthropocene coin and they're both dark sides. <laughs> so on one side you've got, you know, the scientific Right. The hockey sticks, the hockey sticks one after another. Side of the Anthropocene, you've got people like uh, Peter Caribo with the Nature Conservancy. Right. That's not one there, I understand. But right. We were saying, well, yeah, we're advanced. We are the we dominant species on this planet, and we can fix all these. We problems. can fix it. It's yeah. a snake eating its tail. <laughs> yeah. And it's a, um, it's this kind of a shift in human consciousness to where we are in control of every aspect of this planet. I don't know, I don't think there's any humility. There's just so much hubris in, embedded in that idea. There is. That. And it could change. I mean, I, I'm not saying the impacts won't be there, <laughs> but I mean, one good, one good virus could change, could yeah. change the planet or an ast like the joke I make in there, the asteroid strike or the, the volcano um, could change the whole balance of, of these things. I think the temperament yeah. of the messenger, you're such a joyful, I've never yeah. met you before, but you're a joyful <laughs> person I know. Yeah. I, you probably were a kayaker on the kayaker. Yeah. I know a lot about you from the way you just stand there. Yeah. And I think it's really a pleasure to receive a message. 
I, you know, from someone who loves life, yeah, not someone who's just bitter and their world's going to hell. And, you know, I mean, that, sure, that's a message, and I think we probably need all these temperaments. Yeah. And our students hate that message. I enjoy yeah. this temperament. Yeah. I think yeah. it has the foot in both camps of let's enjoy life and, and celebrate the arts, and, but let's get serious. Yeah. I really enjoy that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. You sort of demonstrate it with your song. Yeah, and my um, my students um, we well, I teach this um, I can't, I can't remember the guy's name. I've taught the book three times, but there's a there's a there's a single Anthropocene book that's hopeful, and we've taught it for three years in a row, um, and um, I can get you the reference, but um, but the students love it. I mean, he, he deals, this guy deals with the problems. He says the problems are there, but he really believes that we as a species can solve the problems, and the students love to hear that. And I try to not be too negative. I try to go, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, they, they, they want some hope. Yeah. One more question, then we'll drink some apple juice and eat a cookie. And, Oh, well, thank you very much. Thank you.